today, as you know, we are celebrating the International Day of Multilingualism. And the first two questions you can ask yourself is, firstly, why today? And secondly, why do we need a celebration? Aren't there other days that, you know, celebrate it? So to start with the question of today, 27th of March is the day which is engraved into the probably most iconic and famous multilingual document, at least that I know of, namely Rosetta Stone in British Museum. And Rosetta Stone became so famous that it's all used almost as a kind of symbol of language learning. There are language courses, you know, which are called Rosetta Stone and so on and so on. And it became very important historically because it helped decipher, uh, decipher a hieroglyphic script and so on. So it's a kind of important historical document. But but what I find also interesting is it's, it's a very, very old document and it comes from old Egypt. So here we have, in terms of place, a place which is basically between Africa, Asia and Europe. So almost three continents, so to say, bringing together. So although it is technically in Africa, I would say at least three continents can see, can perceive themselves as having cultures which grew out of the kind of Eastern West Asia, Eastern Mediterranean. And the second important point is that it's a very, very old document because there is this idea very often hearing, oh, well, you know, multilingualism is a modern phenomenon, it has something to do with globalization, with social media, with, uh, with um, uh, you know, all the migration and refugees and so on. But in fact, it's as old as the human race. In fact, I would say it's probably very likely that human language developed in multilingual surroundings. So in a way, multilingualism would have been the, uh, would have been the rule for much of human history. And there's another, I would say, kind of prejudice or misconception that, okay, well, maybe, you know, hunter-gatherers were kind of multilingual, but the moment you have states, state need, you know, an empire language and so on and so on. There were many multilingual empires. In fact, the Persian Empire was extremely multilingual. And Rosetta Stone shows also that you have a document, say, written in three languages. So you have, I mean, the antiquity is full of these multilingual documents. So from this point of view, I think it's a kind of, you know, for several reasons, it's a very nice day to choose as multilingualism. But why, why do we need a day like this at all? Well, there are two days which I can think are kind of going in the same direction. One is the European Day of Languages in late September, but the point is it's European and if we want really to take a global perspective, then I would say, you know, uh, we, we need to go beyond our continent. The second day is on 21st of February, the Mother Tongue Day, which is quite important, commemorating basically a rising in what is now Bangladesh, then East Pakistan, against the imposition of Urdu and practically uh, fighting for Bengali as the kind of mother, mother tongue, mother language. Now the point, the, the problem with this I see is that this is great about our mother tongues, but this is not something that is in our hands. I mean, this is something which, you know, happens through our parents, uh, through the environment in which you grow up. And if you learn languages a bit later or decide to speak, you know, one or more, more than the other and so on, this is all not covered by it. So I think for me, the important thing about the International Day of Multilingualism is that it includes, I would say for me, three distinct but very, very important strands. One is the appreciation of the linguistic diversity of our planet. The idea that it's wonderful, like we have a diversity of geological diversity, biological diversity, and so on, we have linguistic diversity. So the fact that we have different languages is something very, very positive. That is one aspect of it. And this is something we share with the European Day of Languages and indeed with the Mother Tongue Day. The second is also the appreciation for, you know, people who grew multilingually for mother language and so on. But the third element, which is for me very, very specifically about this day as, as let's say, compared with Mother Tongue Day, is that this is also about our wonderful capacity to learn new languages throughout our life. So at the moment, I am speaking a language which is clearly, as you will notice, not my mother tongue, and yet I 
use it all the time and I hope I'm able to communicate relatively okay with it. With my daughter, I speak Spanish, another language which I learned very late in my life, in my 40s in fact, or late 30s, and uh, in a way I hope that we can communicate well as well, so we can learn new languages and in fact one of my big areas of interest is learning languages throughout the lifetime, even in later life, in retirement and so on. And that is something which really is not part of this kind of mother tongue idea and which is very very important for me. So that's why you know, I find European day of, uh, I mean languages clearly more locally or regionally defined, mother tongue language more kind of in terms of early life, whereas the International Day of Languages is really all-inclusive. So it includes the linguistic diversity, it includes the, the mother tongue, but it also includes our wonderful ability to learn new languages and through learning new languages to meet new people, make new friends, discover new worlds and discover ourselves becoming different as we speak different languages. Yeah, I think it's really important. Thank you for sort of highlighting the differences and the importance of having a day like today to really mark the, the, the validity and the, to celebrate multilingualism. I think it is important to sort of highlight that the world doesn't have to be monolingual, bilingual, it, and certainly for many, many centuries or millennia even, it's been multilingual and societies are that way. When you talked about in choosing uh, to speak Spanish to your daughter, for example, learning English as well um, after in childhood, I guess when you got to a point where you were working through it and speaking it as wonderfully as you do now. Now, how much of this multilingual lifestyle for you has been a choice and how much of it has been sort of given nature nurture i guess yes well i i think it's a combination of both and i think it's always a combination of both to a to different degrees so i grew up in fact very monolingually uh, because although my parents were multilingual so both my father and my mother spoke bo very good both polish and german my father was polish speaker uh, he was polish and polish speaker but his german was very very good and my mother was ethnic german but learned polish very well as well so it would have been very easy for me to speak both languages to let's say have uh, german as our language at home but the reason why my parents didn't do it is because in that time in late 60s in krakow the idea was that uh, basically multilingualism is kind of dangerous a child will get confused my mother was pediatrician so she was well informed she spoke with her colleagues she spoke with the with the uh, you know speech and language therapists and so on and the idea was that uh, the idea was that you know this is something kind of well maybe once you know once a child is really really very very fluent in one language and cl with clear identity that's fine but if it's if it if you mix from the beginning they become schizophrenic I mean that was exactly the term being used and by the way which you find also so I know of people who heard that you know just 10 or 15 years ago in Scotland where basically the idea was, you know, if you speak to language, you know, a different language to your child and language of the environment, it will make it schizophrenic. So this prejudice is still not gone completely. And of course I could know that at the same time in Montreal, first studies were shown that in fact, if anything, speaking more than one language is something positive for kids. So from this point of view, I was exposed, let's say indirectly to German, but I didn't really speak it. And then moving to Germany, of course I had to learn German, but you know, it was not a, it was not really a foreign language to me. It's a kind of a strange status. It was, it's not quite my mother tongue, but it's not quite a foreign language. It's something kind of in between. Uh, and then, you know, moving to England, uh, of course, I have to, uh, I, was, I lived in Cambridge for a long time, 11 years before moving to Edinburgh. So the question was, that was of the, the language of the environment. So these three languages, I would say, are for me the languages, well, I mean, Polish and German, the languages of my heritage, and English, the language which was, so to say, clear, I mean, even if I stayed in Germany, if you 
want to work internationally, if you want to travel internationally, you need English as well. Spanish is for me much more a personal choice, because I, I loved Spanish, I loved the sound of Spanish always when I was a child, and there was always this kind of fascination for the culture and the language. So in a way, I have a feeling that, as I say, where, whereas the other languages have been more or less dictated by environment, Spanish is something much more of my choice. Yeah, it's it's funny you mentioned that about you know the the idea of speaking two languages and getting them confused and having this almost schizophrenic um, sort of outcome with that type of uh, education. And you mentioned Scotland as well, where I think definitely there's a stigma attached to Scots uh, for many people, and um, whereas English obviously is its sister language and kind of the bigger sister language in terms of numbers of speakers and where it's used, particularly in education above Scots. Have you noticed during your travels sort of the a difference between people who are raised multilingually or bilingually, where they speak two very different languages like German and Polish that are two different families within the Indo-European group and then sister languages that are from the same language family like English and Scots, for example. You notice a difference in attitudes and a difference in how the code switching is affected and translanging is affected. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I think to be honest, there are two factors which are completely independent, both play a very, very big role here. And one of them is the kind of the linguistic similarity, the other is a prestige, kind of all the sociolinguistic aspects. And I have to say, if my thinking has changed over the last, you know, three, four years, let's say, or three years, the kind of the COVID time, then one of the things is I have been, I became converted to sociolinguistics. I realized now I grew up, so to say, working very much in terms of cognitive linguistic neuroscience, uh, you know, cognitive science and so on. And I realized now how incredibly important sociolinguistics is, because if we think of languages, not as something which is kind of, you know, set in stone in the first few years of our life and then become, so to say, more or less, you know, inflexible, which is not the way we see languages today anyway. Uh, then our what, how we use languages in the context, the context of use and so on become very important. So that means sociolinguistic variables are crucial for cognitive variables. They cannot be separated. And uh, Scotland is a good example because I would say there are two languages to which you find incredible hostility in Scotland. One of them being Gaelic and the other being Scots. Now, of course, linguistically, they are very different. I mean, the argument against Scots is that, oh, it's just a bad English. The argument against Gaelic is, well, no one can say that's a dialect of English because it's so obviously different, but the argument is it's completely irrelevant. It's just you know, a waste of time and so on. But in a way, you find quite a lot of animosity towards both languages. And for me, it's a kind of, to be honest, it's psychological, if not a psychiatric problem. Basically, the kind of feelings of inferiority being compensated by hostility about against the two heritage languages that this country has, which for me is really quite strange. So, so the fact that you have this negative attitudes both to Gaelic and, and uh, Scots would suggest to me that this is more a sociolinguistic problem than a linguistic one, because I say in one case it's very much about the question of dialect and the other it's it's very much a question of being different languages, but then Gaelic perceived as useless, no one speaks it anyway, and so on and so on. Yeah, I, I wonder if it gets trapped under the whole, we have a standardized language variety that we use to educate people, to communicate throughout a nation or a country as you say England or Scotland or Wales or mm -hmm. Poland or wherever. And the kind of the, that standard or the standardized variant that is agreed upon as that mode of communication, whether it's through media or whether it's through education systems or, mm -hmm. you know, just sort of that's often given this higher level of, um, I guess, value. Mm -hmm. and the other variations of the languages 
that are spoken are often then put on a sort of a lower level. And I wonder if there's a re-education that's needed, um, even in a younger, a younger age in schools where this is a standardized form, but it doesn't make it necessarily better in terms of intrinsic value or older even than yeah. the similar other variants around. And is, is that something that you would be able to take on board and how far would that feed into the multilingual uh, narrative? Absolutely. I mean, I would say, I mean, that, that fits, in fact, into the, my experience of the first, you know, two decades of my life. Uh, I would say in Poland, you have a very, very unified language. I mean, you do get a little bit of local variation, so particularly Silesia, where my mother was from. I mean, people will speak kind of, you know, Silesian, but usually if they are educated, they can switch into standard Polish. And very often when I meet, let's say, someone from Poland here in Edinburgh, in most cases, I won't be able to tell which part of the country they are from. They can be from Krakow, where I am from, or they can be from the other end of the country, from Szczecin or from, from Gdańsk. So from this point of view, it's, and and there is, I think, in Poland a very strong feeling of kind of standard. So, in fact, when I was growing up in Krakow, there was a phone, an emergency phone number you could phone where you had your, you know, Polonist on call who could tell you about the spelling and the grammar rules. So to say how to write something correctly, how to say something correctly and so on, which I find, you know, uh, it, it shows, I mean, nowadays probably doesn't exist because people can, you know, uh, check it online. But at that time, I mean, the idea that, you know, you have, you know, maybe your psychological and medical and so advice, but you also need your you know, Polish language advice means that there is a very, very clear idea what is standard. And then I moved to Germany, where in fact local, local uh, varieties are much more pronounced and in fact much more, let's say, positively seen. And then I moved to Switzerland, where I would say the local varieties are absolutely, well, I don't want to say idolatrized, but I mean, extremely positively seen. So within the first three countries in which I lived, I could see very, very different attitudes to local variations. So again, that is for me a very, very, you know, interesting sociolinguistic uh, problem. Probably it's, you know, it can have something to do with the history. I mean, I guess in Poland, for instance, the fact that maybe uh, Poland was, Polish was suppressed so long that the idea was that basically in order to, in order to preserve the language, we have to have it, you know, very, very standardized and unified and so on. Uh, but I would say, you know, it's fine to have varieties, but then the question often comes for a foreigner, what are you supposed to learn? And that is, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, I, for me, the perspective is not just the one of the kind of native speakers, but a perspective of an outsider learning a language. And then, then if it's real, I mean, do you need to learn a specific dialect? Can you kind of speak a mixture of different variants? Uh, that is an open question, and that is, by the way, a question which I find very interesting at this very point in time, because, uh, you know, as, as you probably know, last year, I mean, during the COVID time that I couldn't, you know, where I couldn't travel, I did a, a training to become a tourist guide for Scotland, and uh, I of immediately wanted to, of course, in different languages, so I added immediately last year Polish, German, and Spanish, and this year I am adding Portuguese. And the problem with Portuguese is that the Portugal and Brazilian version are quite different. Within Brazilian, by the way, also, let's say, the Sotaki Carioca from Rio de Janeiro is quite different from Paulista. Uh, so do I need to decide that I speak with a very certain version or can I mix it a little bit? I am not quite sure myself. So, so that is definitely a question which is very much on my mind. Yeah, it is something that I actually saw uh, on a video somebody shared with me recently. And it was a reason somebody gave up learning a language because they said, I was studying the language, I was learning the language, and then I realized I couldn't understand half of the other uh, variations on the same language um, around the country. And I was kind of shocked at this because to me, that's part of the fun of learning the language. You learn... Mm -hmm. You learn a, either a standardized form, 
or a variety of the language. And then you explore by talking to different people who come from different regions and the topic of conversation of which word you use for this and which word you use for that is actually part of the fun for me. Um, so I was kind of a bit unsure as to why that would necessarily be a huge problem. I, I get that, you know, the feeling of not understanding after having studied for a number of years might be a little bit frustrating for some, but it's definitely a talking point, I think. And to your point, there are definitely countries where, you know, we talk about a standardized form of a language. Slovenia is a good example where that standardized form that you learn in books and different things as a foreigner doesn't actually exist as a spoken form in mm -hmm. real terms in Slovenia. It's they have many, many different uh, varieties of Slovene that are mm -hmm. spoken across the country. And it's extremely rich and varied, and they're very proud of that, just as a Swiss, I think. Uh, yeah. And the idea of Switzerdutz as a, as a concept is really a bit of a weird one because there is no real Switzerdutz. It's kind of like Zurdutz, Zugdutz, Baseldutz, mm -hmm. Berndutz, and, and, and the list goes on. Yeah. Um, when it comes to being multilingual, how far do we go? from a standardized form of a language to other varieties of a language to where the people identify with the standardized form as their main language pivotal base. Where do we start sort of from there going into other languages? Well, again, I think it's a very interesting question and it's very much again negotiating our own preferences with the expectations of the surroundings. So very often in some countries, when you come as a foreigner, people will expect you to speak the standard language. And if you try to speak the local dialect, they would find it ridiculous. Sometimes they can even become hostile because they feel you are either making jokes of them or it's almost a kind of cultural appropriation. Uh, so I remember when I moved to Germany and you know I ended up in Bavaria and Bavarian is very different from standard German and I was in Oberbayern, uh, Monau am Staffelsee, so very much a, you know, a Boarish speaking area. Uh, the point was when I was trying to say something in, in Bavaria, I mean, sometimes I found people quite hostile. So uh, do you want to pretend you're one of us? Of course you are not. We know that. So basically they want to keep the language as their own Reserve, and then you know with with you they will speak you know standard German. On the other hand, if you go to Norway, I mean from what well, I know from my Norwegian friends, is I mean, they would say you know you are really integrated when you start speaking with a local accent. In fact. I mean, the little Norwegian I know, I learned from my best friend who is, you know, his family is from Telemarken. And so I would say Ische and not Ike and so on. And Norwegian people love it because that sounds to them like that, that's a real Norwegian and not something you learn just from books. So, so here I would say, you know, I experienced two very, very different attitudes. So it's one thing is your attitude, but the other also is the attitudes of your surrounding, which in some cases, much, might very much reinforce and you know uh, encourage you to take over the kind of local aspects and in the other exactly the opposite no 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 you are not one of us keep you know keep to your standard yeah i i, I like that you mentioned appropriation actually it's something that stood out i mean you, you said a lot of very good things and very interesting things and i think the fact that there's a difference between these different communities is is really important to highlight and that there's not one rule that fits all with this kind of thing. It's very much an individual basis. And I think that individual speakers themselves actually have their own thoughts, ideas, and norms on the idiolects that they use and how they feel about people mm -hmm. using those idiolects. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the same is true, by the way, uh, you know, kind of related question of language mixing. So you have some societies where in a way, you know, you mix languages all your time, all the time, and others where in fact you need to separate them. And that goes back to our prehistory. 
history. I mentioned at the beginning that you know human language developed in probably in multilingual surroundings, and from you know what I know, you know, speaking with my uh, linguist friends who you know did a lot of field work, like Nick Evans from Australia, uh, you will have some societies where in fact you know people switch languages and mix and so on all the time, and you have others where it's absolute taboo to mix them. You speak either this one or that. And sometimes even you are not allowed so for instance there are societies i think in southern china where basically the, the local languages so the mother and father if they speak different languages they are not allowed to speak in the language of the other person because it would be perceived as an appropriation if they don't belong to this group so we have really an incredible variety of this these attitudes and that is important nowadays because I think we moved a little bit from one extreme to the other so one extreme was this idea of you know standard separated languages never mixing and so on and now in this kind of wave of translanguaging and so on which has a lot of positive aspects as well we might end up at the other extreme where basically any attempt at separating languages is seen as kind of reactionary and i think that's equally wrong as the so to say former isolation yeah it's, it's certainly an interesting thing that gets raised a lot and i see it particularly from the united states it's it tends to be the kind of the the place that i think coins a lot of expressions to allow us to discuss some of these uh phenomena and i think it's an important role that it plays in that, particularly with the way things go viral online because of the United States. They give us sometimes vocabulary in the US to be able to discuss exactly what we're talking about now. This idea of cultural or linguistic appropriation is definitely popularized uh, by people from the US. Mm -hmm. When somebody says about accent and let's say accent and not pronunciation how far do you go with with this i mean what i what i observe is a very weird you need to speak with sort of the closest accent possible in many anglophone countries to be accepted into certain spheres of work or you know acting or certain roles and people pay money to to for accent training and and yet on the other side of the coin, you have people shouting from the sidelines, and sometimes often these there'll be a Venn diagram of these two groups interlocking, right? Shouting, you shouldn't learn certain languages or, or in, impersonate certain accents purposefully because it's a type of linguistic appropriation. Absolutely. I mean, it's exactly, I mean, it's this question of kind of closed and open groups and i think there could be at least two reasons why other groups don't want outsider to so to say imitate their accent one is if they are not quite sure and they think you know you are making basically fun of them so particularly if let's say if people in Scotland would feel that, you know, Scots is in fact bad English and then you try to say something in Scots, they will think, you know, maybe you're trying to, to ridicule them uh, and uh, rather than, you know, trying really to, to learn what I th think for me is a fascinating Germanic language, quite different from standard English. But the other is also this kind of feeling of close community, which can be ethnic, linguistic, religious, and so on and so on. So, uh, and I mean, it's not just about accent, but languages generally. So I find it interesting, let's say, with Irish in Northern Ireland, that was another fascinating thing I learned over the last years, where there are some people in the castle, let's say, what happens if now a Protestant Northern Ireland would say, I want now to learn Irish? Some of them would say, wonderful, welcome, we can now share this language, and it's not about religion. But others would say, no, it is other language, we don't want you to come and invade, so to say, our closed linguistic space. And that is something which you will find in language, but then you you can find very very much with accent so uh, so yeah you have you have a lot of say, it's always an interplay of your own feelings uh, you know um, and and um, uh, you know attitudes and then what a certain group let's say wants wants you to do uh, 
I think for me it's, it's I mean I would love to speak with Scottish accent but I kind of I never managed so they are also and it has to be said you know some people are very very good in getting into this accents and others are not so they are big individual differences uh, I know a Spanish woman here in Edinburgh who says you know uh, I mean she speaks not only extremely good you know English with, with very Scottish accent but you know friends of her usually make jokes if she goes for one day to Glasgow by the time she comes comes back to Edinburgh. People in Edinburgh are making jokes that she sounds like being from Glasgow. And then I asked, no, but how do you do it? And then she said, no se, se me pega. So it kind of, it sticks to me. Yeah. So it's not about, it's not about an effortful thing. It's just semepega. And, and that's why I think the problem with accents could be that the best way of learning is probably if you kind of really naturally immerse yourself rather than if you train it because then they will sound maybe a little bit laborious so it's it's a it's a very complex question it is and i i think one of my experiences as well with um certain languages particularly you, you actually have to pronounce it at least as close as the people who speak it as possible for them to understand and because they've not potentially had exposure to enough foreign voices speaking mm -hmm. that's to say people who they're not used to speaking to with who are recognized as a variant of that language mm -hmm. they just sort of their ears close off it almost becomes white noise and they just do not understand and it's not because they're, they're, they're unwilling it's just they're not so you almost have to go for some languages that extra mile to really hone in on the sounds and the print not just the pronunciation sometimes even the porosity the accent even to a to a large degree or they just don't get it absolutely but again there are different aspects so one is probably kind of more cognitive one so i presume if you live in a country let's say like uk where you have a lot of people coming speaking with different accents you are kind of exposed to english so, so much to english being spoken by non-native speakers that you know you have simply the experience if you learn a language that generally people are not used that a foreigner learns then I think in, in Polish, I mean, Polish people never expect, I mean, this kind of idea, you can never learn Polish unless you really grow up there. Uh, then people will be probably much less used, in fact, to listening to foreigners. So that's one point. But the second is, so that's the kind of more cognitive, I mean, experience, cognitive, linguistic. But there is, again, also a kind of more social attitude, you know, whether you, uh, whether you kind of, you, what is stronger for you, the feeling for purity of your language or the well being welcoming? And let's say the kind of, you know, typical stereotype, as you will know, are, let's say, the French and the Italians, where if in French, if you don't say something perfectly, it would be, oh, il fumazo aux oreilles. So, it, you know, it's painful <laughs> to my ears. Whereas in Italian, when you only say, you know, buongiorno, ciao, bella, you will hear, oh, che, be che bene parla italiano. So, so in a way, you will get so it's i think it's both the experience but it's also the it's also the uh the uh you know attitude absolutely i, I mean I, I agree that you know it, it really is the there's a lot going into the part sort of on, on this topic of, of sort of variations of, of language and things as well how far do you think linguists pronouncements on definitions using their terminology from a scientific point of view with a lay audience is useful or problematic well interesting that you ask because just a few days ago i had a very interesting conversation with one of my best friends who is in fact a you know professor of linguistic and typologist martin Haspelat, and we were speaking about definitions in linguistic and so on and as you will probably know i mean linguistic is a discipline which is characterized by incredibly deep 
ideological differences between different schools of linguistics. And you see, I mean, I've been working with linguists for a long time, so I'm kind of quite aware of that. And just recently I started working, you know, with theologians on the question of multilingualism religion, which I find very interesting as well. And to be honest, my feeling is that it's easier probably to find theologians coming from completely different traditions, let's say, you know, reformed Calvinist, Catholic, and maybe, you know, Shia Muslim, to find a common language than for three linguists coming from completely different <laughs> linguistic schools of thought, let's say, you know, Chomsky versus functionalist and so on and so on. So there is very little, there is very little, so to say, really consensus among, among linguists. And that, you know, makes it, of course, problematic, you know, if you want to learn it coming from outside, because very often it would be, well, this means this and this within this theory, but not within the other theory. Yeah, and I guess, you know, how a lay person then interprets any of those labels, say, for example, in a dialect, what a dialect is for a linguist and what a dialect is, and how it's weaponized by the average person on the street in a society. And you were talking about socio linguistics and how important it is to sort of recognize that and how you've got more into it. I, I guess it's deeply problematic. Ab ab absolutely, absolutely. But I, I think, you know, in a way, the way you you need probably to approach linguistic, like you would uh, approaching, let's say, study of religion. Everybody knows that we have different religions. So, uh, you know, you know that you have Christian and Abrahamic religions first, then you have maybe religions coming from Hinduism and so on and so on. And I think that's that's the way I would approach linguistic, that I see it as a, as, you know, a fascinating field with different theories, which are often not necessarily uh, mutually compatible. And, uh, and uh, you know, within this, it also means that then I have the definition, so, uh, you know, seen by so-and-so. I mean, the second point is that in a way, let's say one of the main characteristics of a good scientist is to doubt, is to be critical, is to question everything. Uh, on the other hand, and that is something which I notice because that's one of my problems I find when I kind of, how can I act at the same time as a scientist and, uh, you know, someone who is very passionate about public engagement, as I do now and so on, as you know, for me, it's a very, very important part of, of my life. And there is a certain tension there. And I would say because as a scientist, I feel my main job is, so to say, really to question everything. But if I want to give some ideas, then of course I cannot just say, well, we don't really know, and there are these exceptions and that exception and so on. So in a way, finding, finding a way of convey something which is kind of relatively, relatively consensus, uh, and it's not banal, is uh, so accurate, but, you know, uh, differentiated and still clear to understand. That is the big, that is the big, um, you know, uh, question for me of, of public, uh, public communication. And that's why not all scientists are necessarily great, you know, great communicators, because the, the you know, the essence of the task is slightly different. I think you, you kind of knit the you know you hit the nail on the head that the, there's a, there's a sort of a natural tendency from the scientific side to honour the scientific side <laughs> and and the the public isn't necessarily coming with the same mindset and so they're often looking for very different things and the sort of not knowing thing is not really an acceptable outcome as you see for many of the discussions and arguments online mm -hmm. over many topics not just languages or even religion as you mentioned religion uh, but on many topics they, it's a, that not knowing is is i think a vacuum that many many people on the planet like to just fill with something 
And ab, ab, absolutely. I think, by the way, what happens me a lot in this, I would say, is my medical background. So yeah. it's interesting, of the last years, I kind of realized, in fact, the more I get out of medicine, the more I realize how important medicine is for my thinking. So maybe it's like, you know, like you emigrate from a country and then suddenly you start realizing things about that country. So that is for me, I would say, medicine. So I kind of moved slowly away from medicine and by now I don't, <clears throat> don't even practice regularly. So, uh, but I think a lot about what medicine is. And in medicine, you have to do both. So as a medical scientist, you want to be skeptical. You want to examine evidence for drugs, for treatments, for you know, diagnosis, and so on and so on. But if you communicate with patients, you need to give some kind of well-founded advice. And you cannot just say, well, you know, there are, you know, 51 studies showing this and this and 47 showing that and that. And then, you know, so now decide whether you want to have an operation or not. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. I mean, to change tack slightly, because obviously we're talking about multilingualism as well. And sort of, I know we've got into the detail a little bit. But one of the things that has been a tendency within Europe in particular um, has this sort of lessening of the feeling of a need to learn another language except for English. This I, I, I very much perceive in my kind of travels and my discussions with people, this perception that we speak our home language and we learn English. And sometimes even the home language is neglected mm -hmm. um, in favor of English and English is mixed in with it. Whereas, you know, in previous decades, people would tend to learn maybe the neighbor's language and or neighbor's languages, and then also maybe another international language, whether that was Latin or French or English uh, later. But that tendency tends to be going down. And I know in Europe, there is a desire to get people to at least learn a third language as well, mm -hmm. uh, not just satisfied with just English. First of all, have you, have you had any sort of anecdotes that you could share from your experience with that? And how do we tackle that kind of thing? Thinking? I'm really glad that you mentioned that because it's a very important point and it brings us back to the very beginning of our conversation today. Why is it International Day of Multilingualism and not Bilingualism? Some people use the terms almost almost interchangeably. But for me, the kind of the typical thing about bilingualism would be, well, maybe a family where you have, you know, mother and father speaking different languages. So that was the kind of classical bilingualism. And then you have the kind of modern bilingualism in which everybody learns English as a second language and that's it. And for me, it's not really an enrichment. It basically means that the Anglophone don't learn anything. And and all other nations learn only one language being being English. So that's why I think this, you know, for me, it's really important that it's multilingualism. I would prefer myself even the term plurilingualism, which is in fact kind of officially supported by European Union, European Commission, the idea of, so to say, having a multilingual space. Uh, but I'm happy with multilingualism as it is because for me it's very clearly going beyond bilingualism. And I think with anything, not just with languages, if you know only two things in the world, you just saying that everything is about this dichotomy, is about the is about the contrast. If you only lived in two countries and you always compare them, you think that this is really this dichotomy is really the real one. If you know only, you know, uh, two books or whatever, two theories, this is always the kind of dichotomy. The moment the triangulation happens, the moment that comes something third, you start realizing, well, in this and this, it's more similar to A, but in that, maybe it's similar to B. So suddenly, the world is not just about opposition of two things. It is becoming much more complex, much more lateral. So I think for me, the, the introduction of third language is absolutely crucial. It really, it's like, it brings a, it brings really a kind of depth to anything that we perceive. So cognitively, it's very, very important. Also, politically, it's important because then if you are 
are happen to come from non-English speaking country, then you could say, okay, I learn English, but then I will learn another language. So it's not, it doesn't reduce everybody to have it. And if you look through human history, it's interesting that in many cultures and many times you had this feeling. So let's say for European Western culture, for a long time the two languages you learned were Latin and Greek, and they were not just sin, they were complementary. So the idea was that Latin was the language of the church, Latin was the language of the of law and so on, uh, maybe philosophy, but then Greek was also philosophy and poetry, more lyrical and so on. So you had this idea that the two languages had a kind of different, you know, they are, they are different. that's why, you know, it's plurilingual, it's really about, you know, you have in, in Spain, beautiful figure, Alfonso de Sabio, a king, who was writing the uh, you know, legal political text in Spanish, but the the lyrical text in Proto-Portuguese, because that was uh, Galaico-Portuguese, the old Galician Portuguese. And you have something similar, by the way, also in Islamic world, where clearly Arabic would have been the language of the language of uh, religion and of law, but Persian had a very high status as a language of literature. So in a way, you know, if you really wanted to be a very educated, let's say, Muslim in India until, you know, relatively recently, you wanted to know Arabic for your religious text, but you also wanted to know Persian for the kind of culture. So the idea, and in some way, again, in 9th century Europe, you had French as dominating language, again, of, of culture, literature, and so on, so on, but then German was emerging as a language of science and, you know, and maybe, maybe statecraft. So I would say this, this is something which for me is really, really important. I'm really passionate about the one plus two and about multilingualism. And as opposed to as opposed to uh, to bilingualism because adding a third language really brings us in a different in a completely different frame of mind yeah i mean you're not going to get any arguments from me on that i'm very much on the same page as you um, sure well no, I, I i know i know that we agree but the point is sometimes people would say oh bilingual that's you know so incredible you have two names for everything i would say yes but at at a third and then it starts getting interesting and then i think one one experience probably which we both share is that you know uh, learning language is not a linear curve that you know it's equally difficult. The most difficult step is from one to two, then two to three is already smaller, three to four is even smaller, four to five is smaller, and so on. So it's the, the curve, so to say, get, gets flatter. And by the way, generally, again, if we look at the, you know, hunter-gatherer agricultural societies, very often they are uh, at least, uh, you know, three or four languages, uh, three or quadrilingual. So in many societies you have linguistic exogamy, so the idea that you should marry someone speaking a different language. But if you think that in this society there's also a lot of connections with grandparents, that means that a kid will grow up with four grandparents speaking four different languages. So from this point of view, I would say for me the kind of the normal human, you know, the normal capacity of human brain and mind is three to four languages. And then, you know, Polyglots go upwards, and bilinguals for me is already a certain reduction in linguistic ability. Yeah, I mean, I guess the outlier really within Europe for that type of system now is probably Luxembourg, isn't it? Where it's, yeah. it, it genuinely is a multilingual society. I don't, I can't off the top of my head think of any other country that can really say that with all confidence that the the people, the individuals within society are truly multilingual um, because there are multilingual countries, so to speak, but they tend to be kind of divided along linguistic border lines. And uh, Absolutely. I mean, the question is, do we speak about multilingualism, so to say, as a phenomenon of countries? And then you could have simply monolingual groups li living side by side or people speaking, uh, speaking different languages. And that's, that's a different point. But I mean, Coming back, for instance, to science, I'm very interested in the history of neurology. And if you read the class 
classical author of neurology from 19th century realized that basically any neurologist at that time was supposed to be able to read in three languages at least, namely uh, German, French and English. And they referred to each other's work and that was of course before Google Scholar and they didn't have you know, time to get you know, translation. So it was clear that basically you were reading and following the scientific development in three languages. Uh, and uh, and that was so to say the normal so that's why i think i mean you know for i would say for me you know three languages is, is for me really a kind of healthy baseline rather than something very very you know high and and, and exceptional absolutely thank you so much thomas for for sort of taking the time to come and talk about this and why this is so important to you and why you set up this day um, what I want to do just at the very end is open up the floor to the people um, watching and listening. Why is multilingualism so important to you personally? Well, I would say I mean, for me to live in one language would be like taking away all the, you know, all the spice of life. It would be like life in black and white. Uh, it would be like, you know, uh, life with only one color or one smell or one type of food. I mean, it would simply, it would rob me of so much diversity. I mean, I like immersing myself into languages and yes, I do feel that I behave, think, feel in a different way depending on the language I'm speaking. So, it, so I would find a, I find Multilingual is an incredibly enriching experience and for me monolingual life would be really, really, you know, some, in a, a kind of linguistic prison. Ah, coming back to the situation in Northern Ireland, I was in a very situation with Ulster Scots. Would you like to have your point of view? Oh, that, that's a very interesting point. Uh, I mean, there was, I mean, there is generally uh, seem to be less, let's say, passion about Ulster Scots than there is about uh, about Irish and I don't think necessarily that let's say people who fight for Irish would find Ulster Scots a uh, so to say would find it problematic if Ulster Scots would be added to it so uh, I mean the idea again you know, we are coming back to what you said uh, what you asked you know Richard now about kind of multilingualism uh, I mean, having a country with three languages is not a big problem. Like Switzerland has, you know, three or four if you count uh, Red Roman. By the way, Singapore is has four lang official languages and everything is in four languages. So the idea of having three languages side by side is not really a big issue. And in fact, I hope that, you know, sooner or later, that's what we have in Scotland, that we have basically standard English, Scots and Gaelic being seen as, you know, three complementary aspects. And that would be very, very possible to do in, uh, in Ireland as well. So I don't think there is uh, let's say from the kind of my experience from nationalist community, please correct me if you know if you know more, but that there is no so, so much so to say uh, hostility towards Ulster Scots than uh, as is from the Unionist against Irish. Yeah, it would be interesting if anyone's got any comments and thoughts on that. I'd, be, I'd, I'd definitely like to, to hear. I did I did hear from. Uh, from someone once that there was kind of a that that, that isn't com isn't completely neutral from all sides but um I, I guess i don't know enough to be able to comment further than that like one day's memory yeah i mean i mean the problem also is and in a way it, it makes the situation in, in in northern ireland more complex that let's say irish would be clearly something that is binding Ireland, so to say, or Ulster to Ireland. Now, the Unionist community, I mean, their main symbol is not the Scottish flag, it will be the Union flag, it's the Union flag. Uh, and uh, by the way, I mean, of course, there were a lot of Scottish people who moved to uh, Ireland, but they were also, uh, you know, uh, an Ulster plantation from people from England. So it's not that, you know, all all the population came there from, from Scotland. So in a way, speaking standard English, is 
probably politically more, uh, you know, stressing the union, whereas speaking Ulster Scots could be seen as something which is, you know, tends more towards regionalism. That's an interesting perspective, absolutely. And, and then you have a very interesting relationship between the Ulster Scots community and the Scots community in Scotland because, of course, they are lingui I mean, linguistic maybe close, but politically as opposed as possible because the, the Scots, let's say, Scots community in Scotland tends to be very strongly pro-independence. So definitely not pro-union. So in fact, I would say from my experience, the Scots community is much more pro-independence than the Gaelic one. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's, an, that's definitely an extra dimension, isn't it, to add into the mix? Well, no, I mean, it's, you know, but, but as I say, it, in some way, what, what you said, you know, in the beginning, you find it fascinating when you go to, when you go and realize that people use different words, different expressions, and so on. I find it fascinating to find how language and identity can, you know, appear even very opposing views. So as I say, the same language being associated with something completely different. So I, I find this, you know, this uh, complex sociolinguistics, uh, you know, incredibly fascinating. Definitely. And I think what you've touched on there is the politicization of some of these languages of with having a, an agenda. So when certain groups and the, the sort of the out group of the linguistic community hears the language, it's mm -hmm. almost a, an immediate reaction because they 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 bind that language and linguistic community to a political ideology potentially as well, which oh it, the language it's, down. it's incredibly difficult to separate language and politics, and sometimes you might have also undertones. So just few a week ago or so, I was reading a very interesting paper comparing uh, German and I mean the processing of or let's say how speaking native German versus Arabic can activate different networks so to say in the brain. A brilliant paper in many respects, but they have so to say apparently they didn't really go into much detail of, uh, in terms of linguistic and writing systems so they distinguish like the indo-european languages which are written in latin script and arabic which is written in a very different way so you have really what i would call neuro-orientalism you have the othering so we europeans we use latin script now firstly a lot of indo-european languages don't use Latin script, you know, whether, uh, and don't use script that go from left to right. I mean, you know, they use, whether it's Persian or uh, or uh, Pashto or Urdu or Kurdish and so on and so on. You have a lot of languages and also what they were claiming about kind of alphabet wouldn't even work for most Indian alphabets, whether you say the Hindi, Bengali, all the Devanagari basics. So it's very much this kind of idea, although it's a neuroscience paper, there's very much this idea about kind of our brains and their brains being somehow different. So I think we really, we need to be very, very careful where we think about the brain even if it looks in kind of objective, you know, neuroscientific meaning, we have to be very, very careful that they can, those things can go into stereotypes, into, uh, into you know, political thinking, ideologizing, and so on and so on. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I mean, it was, a, it was as always, a fascinating conversation, very, very much, you know, thank you very much. And, you know, uh, brought me to think about, about about some other interesting aspects so it's always a pleasure speaking with you richard i think we could we could speak for hours and hours <laughs> absolutely. absolutely and i i hope we are not boring others with that <laughs> hopefully not okay thomas thank yes, you so much bye thanks everyone for joining thank you take care bye bye